This is Ham College, episode 38 for February 28, 2018. Ham College is brought to you by ICOM. From DSTAR to SDR, ICOM uses the most advanced technology in their radios. And by hamstudy.org, a great way to study for your next license exam. Hi, welcome to Ham College episode 38. I'm Danny Thomas. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Jerry Lewis. <laughs> well, yeah. something like that. I don't, yeah, that's all I could come up with. That wasn't a very good one. Yeah, I knew it was going to catch you off guard. It but, did. Um, well, we're back with another interesting show here tonight. We... We've got uh, a good bit to cover. We've got a history lesson in here, too, for the uh, first time in several yeah, episodes. Yeah, sort of a history lesson, a little bit of mm -hmm. one. Some interesting stuff we're going to touch base on this time. Yep. Yeah. What, what did we talk about last time? Oh, well, uh, we talked about some of the Q codes, didn't we? We did talk about Q QSL, codes. We sure did. The best that I remember, we did. We did. We also talked about CW operations, and we talked about transformers. Yeah. Oh, we sure did. If you're watching live, you want to go to the chat room, and that's amateurlogic.tv/chat. We'll be looking at it on and off throughout the show, uh, particularly every time we ask a question to see what, what the answer is. What the answer is. Sometimes it's right, sometimes it's all over the place, just like just us. Just like us, Yeah, exactly. At least they're, they're following the lead. We're setting a good example then, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we're, set, we're setting an example. Yeah. I'll, I'll go that far. Okay. Okay. So uh, if, uh, if you're watching the live stream and you're not in the chat room, come on and join us at the link you see right there on your screen. Uh, because you're missing half the fun if you're not in the chat. That is true. Well, are you about ready to dive on in tonight and get started with some questions? I'm about as ready as I'm going to get. Well, that's good enough for me. So first one here, I don't know, flip a coin. Who's going to read this one? <laughs> what is one advantage of selecting the opposite or reverse sideband when receiving CW signals on a typical HF transceiver? A, interference from impulse noise will be eliminated. B, more stations can be accommodated within a given signal passband. Or C, it may be possible to reduce or eliminate interference from other signals. Or D, accidental out-of-band operation can be prevented. Okay, well, th I think this one won't be too hard to figure out. Some of the answers we can rule out right away. Accidental out of band operation. Um, if you look at the question, it's talking about receiving CW, not transmitting it. Mm -hmm. So let's remember receiving. So, no, if you're receiving, you, you can't operate out of band for listening. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we can knock out D right there. A, interference from impulse noise will be eliminated. No, swapping sidebands on a receiver won't eliminate impulse noise. Impulse noise is like that uh, power line buzzing mm -hmm. and the little spikes and signals. N normally, your noise blanker is what would eliminate that type of noise. So it's, it's not A. B, more stations can be accommodated within a given signal passband. No, because the passband is is only so wide, and whether or not you change what you're listening to, the passband is still the same width. But C, it may be possible to reduce or eliminate interference from other signals. 
That would be a good reason. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's the answer. And so do most of the people in the chat room. Okay. Well, let's find out. See, it may be possible to reduce or eliminate interference from other signals. But you nailed that one. Okay. Well, I've got one. I didn't know you were OCW operator. I'm just a listener. Oh, that's why you got yeah, that. That's, yeah. <laughs> if it had been a transmitting question, it had been anybody's guess as to whether or not I got it right. Although I have transmitted CW before. With a keyboard. With a keyboard. <laughs> to fess up. Why is it good to match receiver bandwidth to the bandwidth of the operating mode? Is it A, it is required by FCC rules? B, it minimizes power consumption in the receiver. C, it improves impedance matching of the antenna. Or D, it results in the best signal-to-noise ratio. Okay, uh, it's not required by the FCC rules. Match your receiver bandwidth, receiver. Mm -hmm. So it's not required by the FCC rules to, to receive any certain bandwidth. No, they don't really care what you listen to. Right. Now, transmitting... That's a different story. story. But this yeah. is receiving. Or B, it minimizes power consumption in the receiver. I just don't think that's going to have much of an effect, if any, at all. Mm -mm. See, it improves impedance matching of the antenna. No, that's, that's not going to make any difference on the impedance matching. So the answer is going to be D. It results in the best signal-to-noise ratio. Well, that's and, what, and that's, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, that's the only one that really makes any sense yeah. there. Mm -hmm. So if you're, if you're listening to this much spectrum, but your signal's in this much, you're still going to, you're going to get this much noise in yeah. with it. So it's just going to. Yeah. Whatever the signal is like occupying some noise is. Mm -hmm. and, and this so. is actually similar to what I showed on the last uh, Amateur Logic with yeah. the little pre-selector, mm -hmm. the MFJ pre-selector that I have. Well, let's see. That's what everybody's saying in the chat room there. It is. Results in the best signal yeah, to noise ratio. That. Which of the following is a purpose of a beacon station as identified in the FCC rules? A. Observation of propagation and reception. B. Automatic identification of repeaters. C. Transmission of bulletins of general interest to amateur radio licensees. Or D. Identifying net frequencies. Which of the following is the purpose of a beacon station as identified in FCC rules? Observation, uh, propagation, and reception. Mm, I'll say possibly. B, automatic identification of repeaters. No, a beacon and a repeater are, are two mm -hmm. different things. C, transmission of bulletin or general interest to amateur radio licensees. No, a beacon... The beacon doesn't um, transmit any bulletins. D, identify net frequencies. No, a net and a beacon are two different things. I'm going to say it's A, observation of propagation and reception. That's what they're all saying over and in the chat I room. Concur. Yeah, at what a beacon is, it's just a, um, a signal that is transmitted over the air with nothing but an ID on it. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have any other information or, or bulletins or um, net, net type of activities. It's just an ID. And the reason is I'll transmit an ID here uh, with a beacon and then someone else way far away can listen and if they hear my, uh, my ID or my beacon station there on the air, then they'll know that the propagation is working between them and me at that particular time, mm -hmm. and they can tell how propagation is, because on VHF and UHF, yeah, propagation remains the same most of the time. It can change, but uh, generally propagation is, is pretty similar all the time, unless there's uh, some type of band opening, temperature inversion or something, but on HF, Propagation can be all over the place on different days, different times of the day. Oh, yeah. So beacons help you determine where the best propagation is at that time. Mm -hmm. Or 
how good an antenna is working over another antenna. You know, just basically propagation and reception. Yeah, it's a good known source. Yeah. Yeah, you, you can make a lot of judgments based off of that. You can. Exactly. Very useful information. Next question here. With which of the following conditions must beacon stations comply? A, a beacon station may not use automatic control. B, the frequency must be coordinated with the National Beacon Organization. C, the frequency must be posted on the Internet or published in a national periodical. Or D, there must be no more than one beacon signal transmitting in the same band from the same station location. Okay, which one must the beacon stations comply? A, beacon station may not use automatic control. I think, I think they, they can. I don't see why that would matter. Well, they're pretty much automatic. Uh-huh. B, the frequency must be coordinated with the National Beacon Organization or the dreaded NBO, which I've never heard of. The National, National Beacon, Beacon Organization. organization. I'm so not. That's a made-up organization, I'm pretty sure. Yep. If it exists, I've never heard of it, so I'm not picking that one. Frequency must be posted on the Internet or published. No. Do you think you can look that up from the call sign that's coming from the beacon? Yeah, I think, you know, there's been beacons a lot longer than there's been internet. Mm -hmm. Or D, there must be no more than one beacon signal transmitting in the same band from the same station location. That's the only one that makes any sense. Yep, I'll agree with you. I'm going with D, Delta. And that's what just about everybody's saying over in the chat room there. So let's see. You nailed it. Shock up one more. That was close. <laughs> not really. <laughs> no, not really. Oh, I'm glad this one's yours. What is the power limit for beacon stations? Not bacon stations, like they're saying in the chat room. They must be hungry out there. Yeah. Because they, they keep talking about bacon. A, 10 watts PEP output. <laughs> uh, B, 20 watts PEP output. Or C, 100 watts PEP output. Or D... 200 watts PEP output. Well, I think I have a hunch on this, one, but I'm not sure. So I'm glad this one's yours. Well, I am sure. <clears throat> and right off, you would think, well, a beacon station, that's usually not running much power. So you would think maybe 10, maybe 20 watts. You wouldn't think it was 200. That just seems like... Uh, that seems over the top. Yeah. But I believe, well, what about 100 watts? What do you think it is, Tommy? I know the answer, so I'm just going to ask you, what do you think it is? Power limit. Most of your radios are 100 watts. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think that it would be that much, but I got a hunch that it probably is. 100 watts, now because you said that, but I was thinking probably 10, 10 watts maybe, but. Well, this one, this was a tricky one. If you didn't know the answer to it, which to be honest, when I was typing in the questions, I was unsure as to the answer. Um, a lot of people are thinking it's A. Yeah, no. that's, that's what I would, I would think, but I. Mm -hmm. Well, that's kind of what I was thinking, but actually, it's uh, C, 100 watts. Huh. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Yep. Really no good way to reason that one out either. Other than just knowing what the answer is. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, 100 watts. So you could run a beacon with full power from most HF transceivers. I, I would have almost bet anything that it wasn't 200 watts. Yeah. But the other three were wide open, but... Yeah. I, I sure would have thought it would have been less. Well, that one tripped up everybody. Everybody was thinking it was 10, and I'll have to be honest. Initially, I thought it was 10 yeah. as well. So We would have had a buzzer there had I not peaked. 
What segment of the 20 meter band is most often used for digital transmission? Hmm, is it A, 1400 to 14.05 MHz? B, 14.070 to 14.100 MHz? C, 14.150 to 14.225? Or D, 14.275? to 14.350 megahertz. This was mine. Mm -hmm. uh, the answer is B, 14.070 to 14.100. Now, if you hadn't have been trying digital modes for the last couple of days, do you think you would have got that? No, I didn't remember. I wouldn't have remembered it yeah. because I had to look it up when I was when I was playing around with it. Apparently, everybody over in the chat room does a lot of digital modes. Probably so. They, I mean, if I was home more, I would yeah. do it, too, because I, I actually kind of like it. But uh, I don't get to use it enough, so I didn't remember, and I had to look it up. I I probably would have got it because I've, I'll, I'll trickle down to that part of the band every so often and listen. Uh, well, that's all I'm going to say sure about it sure was handy right that I'd been playing around with that. It, it worked out pretty good for you, it didn't did. it? It did. It paid off. B, 14.070 to 14.100 megahertz. Okay. I think we got one more question sort of like that. You can ask me this one. Okay. What segment of the 80 meter band is most commonly used for digital transmissions? A, uh, 3570 to 3600 kilohertz. B, 3500 to 3525 kilohertz. C, 3700 to 3750 kilohertz. Or is it D, 3775 to 3825 kilohertz? Hmm. I know the answer to this one, too. I know the answer to this one, too. And it's mighty convenient... You know, that in each band, yeah, yeah, there is a pattern. Now, well, let's just get on with the answer first. Everyone in the chat room knows it's A, as, as seems like both of us do. And it is A. And, yeah, the pattern there, the last two digits are 70. And just, it starts right around there. Well, it's, uh, it, it, both of them end with 70. Yeah, because 3,500 is the bottom of the 80-meter band. <clears throat> right along in there is mostly CW. Just above that is where we start getting digital. 3,570. Well, cool. So that one was easy enough That's as well. That's a little well. hint to help you remember. That is. It, I mean, it's, it's the good same to memorize them, them, but it, they do end, the ones that end in 70 for the starting frequency mm -hmm. that's your answer yep all right let's make it a little bit tougher now and i'm glad this one falls on you but i think you probably know the answer because you were studying up on this subject which of the following describes bodot code is it bodot or bodat bodow 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 it's french My? so the t is silent yeah is it Bodo. A, Bodo. a 7-bit code with start, stop, and parity bits? B, a code using error detection and correction. C, a 5-bit code with additional start and stop bits. Or D, a code using cell cal and listen. And I'm just going to go for straight for the throat right here. So it's going to be C, 5-bit code with additional start and stop bits. And you know how, how I knew that? You looked it up today. Because I got a, you got a history, history lesson, lesson on the whole thing right here. So <laughs> Complete with diagrams. Well, well, you do. I just happen to know that you got that sitting there. And, uh, boy, this, would have, this is a, a tough one. But the guys in the chat room... They they had no problems. Well, there's a couple in there that are a little questionable. A five bit code with additional start and stop bits. You know that's something that uh, I don't really know that how much Bodai is used anymore. 
Well, Apparently, it, must be enough to have a question well, in the pool. It's ready. Oh, it's it, the same thing. Okay. Well, see, if I had w waited for the history lesson, I would have known that, huh? It's right here, man. You should, yeah. Here, you want to read it? The history lesson this month is about the origins of Bodo, or Riddy, or radio teletype. It was invented by Emil, no relation to Emil, the cheap old man from Amateur Logic, Bodot. Anyway, he was born September the 11th, 1845, and he died March 28th of 1903. He was a French telegraph engineer and an inventor of the first means of digital communication called Bodo Code. After he finished school, he got, ended up getting a job with the French Post and Telegraph Administration, where his training and his work inspired him to develop his own telegraph system. Bodo invented one of the first telegraph systems that were able to transmit five messages simultaneously. Bodo hmm. invented his telegraph code in 1870, patented it in 1874. It was a five-bit code with equal on and off intervals, which allowed telegraph transmission of the Roman alphabet, punctuation, and control signals. So you're saying there was, there was Bodo before there was radio? Oh, it was yeah. actually this on was the telegraph. Over, yeah, this was over one a single wire. They could do all it over one wire. Wow. So it's pretty impressive, really. But yeah. what, wait, there's more. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> the Bodo system was accepted by the French Telegraph Administration in 1875. Uh, fundamentals of the system are still in use today in the RIDI mode that we use in amateur radio, or RIDI or RTTY. RIDI has a typical baud rate for amateur operation of 45.45 baud, which is approximately 60 words per minute. It's still very popular keyboard-to-keyboard -keyboard mode in amateur radio. The term baud was actually named after him. For its transmission speed, RIDI isn't very efficient. The typical RIDI signal with 170 hertz shift at 45.45 baud requires around 250 hertz of bandwidth more than double that required by PSK-31. Ready using either AFSK or audio frequency shift keying or FSK frequency shift keying modulation is moderately resistant to noise and data transmission errors. Some other more modern modes have error correction built in. We mentioned it was a 5-bit system, but the state of the bits are called mark and space. In this image, the tighter patterns or higher frequency are considered high or mark. The lower frequency are considered low or space. Mm -hmm. And these are used to look up characters in the previous chart. If you look at the bottom where it's shaded, you can see these are the, the highs and the spaced ones are the lows. And they're reflected in the very top up there as well. Mark, space, mark, space, mark. So that's a five-bit um, five-bit character right there that's coming across. And if you use the lookup table that we showed earlier, this is the, the letter T. So there's the high, low, high, low, high, or, or mark, space, mark, space, mark. So that hmm. came up to the, the letter T. This is a copy of the original one, so it's a little bit hard to see on the screen. But, uh, wow. But it's pretty interesting stuff. It's pretty amazing, really, that... Uh, that you can do all that, They'd send all those five bits over the air like that. Because if you think about it, you would think about them coming serially and, and not almost parallel like that. Yeah. So it's, it's pretty wow. cool stuff, really, for, for back in this day. It's pretty amazing. It really is. The research that I did, this was, uh, I summarized a lot of it because it was just way too long. Yeah. But it was mostly uh, around printing the teletype stuff. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, obviously we're using it for radio and seeing it on the computer screen, but the, it's the same principles. They, you do the same shift key, frequency shift keying, and you use basically the same lookup table, although it's been slightly modified and enhanced to add some other characters. And then there's yeah. a, a European version and a, one we use over here too, but they're pretty close to the same. But it's pretty neat stuff. It is. I did not know. I, I thought there was a, a Boda mode. It is. It's called Ready. Yeah. So, so, so it's pretty cool stuff. Well, we'll be back in just a moment. We've got, uh, well, a lot more to go tonight. Communicating has never been more fun than with ICOM. From DSTAR to SDR, 
ICOM uses the most advanced technology in their radios. The SDR you've asked for is here. ICOM's new 7610 is a high-performance RMDR with the ability to pick out the faintest signals even in the presence of stronger adjacent signals. The new ICOM IC7610 is a direct sampling, software-defined radio that will change the world's definition of a SDR transceiver. RF Direct Sampling System, 110 dB RMDR, independent dual receivers, and dual digicell. Communicate with a new D-Star communications device. Easy to operate, the ID31A Plus is available in silver, red, or gold. Worldwide digital communication. Share pictures and text messages. IPX waterproof, compact, lightweight, and tough. The ID31A Plus is the new UHF handheld that you'll want. Visit ICOMAmerica slash amateur for more information on all the great ICOM radios. Well, it's that time in the show where we have a little swag contest here. It is. You know, that 7610 on that uh, spot you just played was a nice radio. I see there's one still sitting over there. There is one sitting over there. You know, and we, we just did a, a video with Ray that should be out here pretty soon showing that thing. It's, it's a super nice mm -hmm. radio. Some final post-production to be done, uh, and then it'll be released. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing. I can't wait to see what we did. No. Yeah, yeah well, I'm still it. seeing it myself. <laughs> <laughs> so it's time to win some ICOM swag, a nice ICOM ball cap, and a nice ICOM ham crew t-shirt. You know, I meant to hit Ray up for another one of these when we saw him the other night, and it slipped my mind. But look uh, just as good coming to the ham fest as you will when you leave. It's a guy that uh, we see around frequently in the social media groups. I don't know if he's in the chat tonight. I have not. Oh, well, cool. I have not looked to see. It's Bob West, W-A-8-Y-C-D. And Bob said he's watched most episodes via download. Uh, last month was his first time to catch a live stream. I recommend Ham College to all my tech class students. You guys rock. Well, cool. Thanks, Bob. I hope you enjoy the, uh, the swag. Yep. And I'm sure they'll be reaching out to you here pretty quick. Yeah, well, it's in the mail. He, oh, it's he, already in the mail. Yeah, he, he shipped it today. Oh, before he even recorded it. That is fast. That faster than the speed of light, man. He knew who the one before we did. Yep. No. No. <laughs> oh, that's cool. So uh, tell them how other people could win this. Well, if other people would like to win this, and why wouldn't you? I it's, want to win one. It's free stuff. It's uh, cheap old man approved. Uh, you just sent an email to hamcollege at amateurlogic.tv just like Bob did. And we will throw your name in the hat. You don't Not have Not in to. this hat. No. No, in another hat. We, we draw a lucky winner every month. You don't have to have anything special in your email, although you have to have a name. That is a requirement. You do have to have a name and an email, and an address. email address. That's the only two things, though. But you don't have to have a call sign. If you got a call sign, well, that's good, too. Uh, just drop us a note in there, say uh, whatever you like, and um, well, just like Bob did here. And we'll read it on there if your name gets drawn, and ICOM will send you a nice prize package here. Yep. Uh, it's a good, nice shirt. Good, it is a good, good heavy shirt. And it's a shame that the dog ate yours. I don't know. I just can't for the life of me imagine what happened to that shirt. But I do I do still have my cap. Oh, but yeah. I don't know what happened to the shirt. How are the two separate frequencies of a frequency shift keyed FSK signal identified? A, dot and dash. B, on and off. C, high and low. Or D, mark and space. Oh, I just gave the answer to this one. I think you did. I did. I'm, I'm sure of it. Okay. Now we got to see if you were paying attention. Yeah, we do. <laughs> how are you are sleeping the, in class? How are the two separate frequencies of a frequency shift keyed FSK signal identified? Dot and dash. No. That's, that would be CW. On and off. That would be digital. High and low, that would be digital. Mark and space 
seems familiar to me. Um, that's what everybody's saying over in the chat room, so I think I'm going to go with that, Tommy. to it. Well, everybody in the chat room, they were, they were right. They nailed it. Mark in space. Here, this is for, for the chat room. Way to go, chat room. <laughs> One for you. What is the most common frequency shift for radio emissions in the amateur radio HF band? Is it A, 85 hertz? Uh, B, 170 hertz. C, 425 hertz. Or D, 850 hertz. Hmm. Okay. I see a lot of Bs coming in on the chat room, but I, I, I know the answer because it was just in my article as well. So the answer is going to be B, 170 hertz. So you're saying it's B. So I'm saying it's B. And you are right, along with everyone in the chat room. I tell you, these guys in here tonight, they know their digital they, stuff. They do. Apparently, they do a lot more digital than I do. Because I, I wouldn't, I, I could be honest with you, I wouldn't have known that if I hadn't have done the research for the history lesson here. Somehow, I knew this one. I, I've I, never really done the, yeah. the, those I, modes. Yeah. To not, at least not much. I've done really. I hadn't done it in a while. But somehow I knew it was 170 hertz, and I, I have no good explanation for that. Yeah. You just, know, my, my 7100 will copy it, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I, if I use software and the computer hooked up to it, I could send it as well, but I've, I have copied it before, and I know that's in the settings in there, but I did yeah. not remember it. Yeah. Okay, what is a good way to avoid unwanted effects of stray RF energy in an amateur station. Oh, we're over into the electronics part. A, connect all equipment grounds together. That, that happened mighty fast, didn't it? It did. Didn't even see it coming. Yeah. B, install an RF filter in series with the ground wire. Or C, use a ground loop <laughs> for best con conductivity. Or D, install a few ferrite beads on the ground wire where it connects to your station. I think if I went up to, well, we don't have a radio shack, if I could go buy a box of ground loops. You think Amazon's got them? I can help you make one. <laughs> what is a good way to avoid unwanted effects of stray RF energy in an amateur station? A, connect all equipment grounds together. Seems like that could be it. B, install an RF filter in series with the ground wire, no, that uh, that would that would not be what you'd want to do. C. Use a ground loop for best conductivity. No, a ground loop is something you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. D. Install a few ferrite beads on the ground wire where it connects to your station. No, that's not it either. Um, the only one there that really makes any sense. Yeah. If you ever had any experience with grounding at all. Yep. It's a connect all equipment grounds together. Uh, chat room is saying that too. Can't fool that chat room. You can't. Uh, I want to talk just uh, a little bit about that, and this is, I guess, as uh -oh. good a place as any. Yeah. You know, we try to avoid the subject of grounds because it's so controversial. This is like politics, and like there's a lot of things that you just don't really talk about, and grounding mm -hmm. is one of them. Yeah. Everybody's got an opinion on it. Mine comes from a, a broadcasting background where, well, it, it agrees with the answer A there. Connect all your equipment grounds together and then go to ground with it. Now, one thing that it doesn't mention there is those grounds that run to all your equipment, you know, all your equipment goes to a common point, you know. Mm -hmm. Like a bar or something. A bar or something. Ideally, you'll want all of those uh, ground cables going to that central point to be the same length. If you use braid, which is good, copper strap, which is excellent, or just wire. 
you want to make all those wires the same length, if, it, if at all possible, connect them together, then go to ground. If one of those wires is longer than the other, say uh, a lot longer, you're setting yourself up for a ground loop. And that's because the ground potential on each piece of gear is not the same. If those cables are all the same length going to that common ground, then they're all exactly at the same potential. So there's no one point that is floating higher above ground than the others. And that's a, the basics of, of all grounding schemes, pretty much, is, is that right there. Now, Bob Heil really is a proponent of, uh, you know, when you've got a, a three-prong electrical outlet. I don't, uh, I don't have a cable handy here, but you know, normally you got two conductors and then you got a, a pin for ground there that mm -hmm. you plug in your 110 volts. Bob says use one of those little ground oscillator tabs like you would use if you in an old house and you only got the two slots there and you don't have the yeah. ground. One yeah. of those little plugs that just breaks the ground connection so you're only connecting to the um, two two poles there with the electricity and not a ground. He says... Oh, and then ground the chassis of your gear? Yeah, that or, or not. He's saying float that ground right there. Use one of those adapters to get rid of RFI on your signal. Now, I'm going to say in some cases that will work. Uh, I, mean, I can't safe? say... Well, no, it probably... Um, well, it's I won't say it's illegal, but it doesn't go with the uh, electrical code. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it is, in some situations, it's, it will get rid of RFI. And uh, so just, just something to think about there. I can't say if it's uh, wrong or right, but just that I, I know that it'll work in some cases, and Bob is a, is a big proponent of mm -hmm. it. Interesting. Yep. So yeah, I see why we don't talk about ground stuff very that often. That's as far well, almost as far as I'm gonna go in the ground. <laughs> uh, that all those equipment grounds that you've got going <clears throat> together should also be tied to uh, the electrical ground there, where it enters your shack, or at a, a common point as well. To put it all at the, the same potential. Now, you might find some cases that is uh, that doesn't really work for you. You know, you might have RFI problems after you do that. Yeah. So my rule of thumb on all of this and getting rid of RFI is do whatever works. Mm -hmm. um, whatever eliminates RFI and whatever is safe against lightning could be two different things. Ideally, you know, they they both go inside. If you, if you've got good uh, lightning protection grounds, you've also eliminated RFI. So keep that in mind as we move on to these other questions on uh, of a similar nature here. This one I don't remember who read. It's, I read. Uh, so okay, what might be the problem <laughs> if you receive an RF burn when touching your equipment while transmitting on an HF band? Assuming the equipment is connected to a ground rod, a flat braid rather than round wire has been used for the ground wire. B, insulated wire has been used for the ground wire. C, the ground rod is resonant. Or D, the ground wire has high impedance on that frequency. What might be the problem if you receive a burn? when you touch your equipment while transmitting and assuming that it's connected to a ground rod. Flat braid rather than round wire has been used. Well, flat braid, braid would be better than the round wire anyway because the gives you more, more surface, area, the skin, more surface, the skin yeah. effect. Insulated wire has been used. Oh, the insulation on the wire is not going to matter as long as you stripped it off where your connections are. So. Yep. 
Uh, the ground rod is resonant, and that's not going to matter. I th it's going to be D. The ground wire has high impedance on that frequency. Yep. So the other ones just don't even make any sense. So I guess if you got uh, a high amount of resistance on that frequency right there, you don't have a good ground. Well, that's what they're saying over in the chat room. <clears throat> and I think we're all in agreement on that. If the ground wire has uh, a high impedance on the frequency you're operating on, then it's not really functioning very well as a ground. It's, uh, it's like you cut the ground wire and put a big resistor in mm. there. You know, uh, and, and on, the, uh, on C there, I'll say one other thing. You can rule that out immediately. The ground rod is resonant. You'd think, yeah, maybe that could be it, but... But not if it's in the ground. But, but no, it couldn't be that at all because we're talking about HF band. No one has a ground oh. rod that is that yeah, long. It would be quite a long. There would be a long rod, ground rod. Yeah, yeah you'd be would. striking water or something on some bands. <laughs> oh, <well>. Yeah. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. All right. Got one for me? Oh yeah. There's plenty where those came from. How can a ground loop be avoided? A, connect all ground conductors in series. B, connect the AC neutral conductor to the ground wire. Or C, avoid using lock washers and star washers when making ground connections. Or D, connect all ground conductors to a single point. Well, well I think you already answered this. I think I have. It's not a connect all ground conductors in series. No, they're all in parallel coming to a common point. You don't go like from one piece of gear to the next to the next. There may be some people that have it hooked that oh, way. Oh, it sure would be easier to do that. It would be easier to do and if you're short on wire, but that's not the right way. No. Uh, B, connect the AC neutral conductor to the ground wire. No. For the for goodness sakes, don't do that. <laughs> the neutral is not in an AC outlet. The neutral may not be at the same potential as the ground, um, you know, in your electrical. It should be, theoretically, but, you know, if your uh, uh, circuit breaker box is on the other side of the house and the wires are run way over here, they, they're not. And you mm -hmm. should never use your neutral as a ground. Uh, C, avoid using lock washers and star washers when making ground connections. No, that's, that's not right at all. That wouldn't make any difference. Uh, D, connect all ground conductors to a single point. And yeah, I'll, I'll answer that earlier. And Everybody got it right in the chat room. It's D. Good job. Okay. It's almost like you had premonition. It is. What could be a symptom of a ground loop somewhere in your station? A. Receive reports of hum on your station's transmitted signal. B. The SWR reading for one or more antennas is suddenly very high. C. An item of station equipment starts to draw excessive amounts of current. Or D. You receive reports of harmonic interference from your station. Hmm. Well, I can go ahead and say the answer is going to be A, because I've heard that many times before. Yeah. Just from experience. And it's not going to affect the SWR on one or more of your antennas. An item of station equipment starts to draw excessive amounts of current. So this just shouldn't affect that either. Mm -hmm. And you receive reports of harmonic interference. I don't yeah. even know what that is. Harmonic? Well, if you're putting off a harmonic, how would you even... No, that just doesn't even make sense. There is such a thing as a harmonic well, interference. Well, I know what a harmonic but is. But it's not from a ground leap. But it, yeah. <laughs> I'm going to agree with you. <clears throat> and the chat room does. It is a... You've received reports of hum on your station's transmitted signal. That's the only one that makes any sense up there. The only yep. one it can be. Yep. It's only one that's right. That's enough right there to 
that you know it's correct. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what effect can be caused by a resonant ground connection? A, overheating of ground straps. B, corrosion of the ground rod. C, high RF voltages on the enclosure of station equipment. Or D, a ground loop. What can be caused by a resonant ground connection? Well, I don't think you'll overheat your ground strap. If your ground strap is overheating, <laughs> you may need to think about you calling the fire direct, department. You, you may know? have hooked up your ground rod to the to the yeah. uh, to the hot lead on your electrical instead of on the <laughs> yeah. neutral. They were talking about it in the last question. Yeah, <laughs> you definitely got an issue there. <laughs> uh, B corrosion of the ground rod. Now, no. C high RF voltage on the enclosure of station equipment. Uh, I think that's going to be your answer. D, a ground loop. No, uh, a ground loop is is not caused by resonance. So the only one really there, and, and you know, it's maybe a little tricky sounding, but the only one it could really be is C. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. Because, it, other, well, I guess we're going to see if it's right first before we start. And it is. So, so your ground... It's basically acting like an antenna and uh, yep. picking up the RF. And it's, it makes sense. Yep. That's it, yeah. Because if it's resonant, that means your signal is kind of like, almost like it's being amplified or, or concentrated mm -hmm. right there in your uh, ground connection. So, we'll have more of these type of questions in next month's episode but for tonight i think we have covered them that was it that we was didn't it get a buzzer tonight i don't guess we did and we Emil's tried in the ch and meals in the chat room too he loves the buzzer well he did have a guest appearance he did have a guest appearance that is correct well what do you say that um we take a quick break are you new to the ham world or an existing amateur operator who wants to take your license to the next level, study for your radio license exam at hamstudy.org. Hamstudy.org is a free online learning tool powered by ICOM. It was created by Richard Bateman, KD7BBC, Michael Stuffelbeam, KV9G, and Rich Porter, KK6GKE, and it uses a modern web design to enhance the experience of studying for your technician, general, and amateur extra exams. Since 2013, hamstudy.org has helped new and existing hams to familiarize themselves with the question pools, use stats-based flashcards to focus on material they need to learn, and take practice exams to gauge progress. Visit hamstudy.org on your desktop computer or mobile device. Register for a free account at hamstudy.org to access personalized study history and other site features. Prepare for an exam in an intuitive and comprehensive manner. Check out hamstudy.org powered by ICOM for free learning tools. Good luck on your next exam. Tommy, where would you get the latest in amateur logic and ham college swag. Well, you know where all the cool people get their amateur logic and ham college swag is at amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com. Oh, tell me more. Yeah, so if you go to that amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com that I just mentioned, you can find th everything from shirts, hats, sweatshirts, jackets, hoodies, you name it. There are all kinds of cool things on there. You really should. People should just go check it out and look. There's a lot of great gift ideas. Yep. It is for for your favorite ham. For your favorite or your not so favorite or, ham. Or yourself. They'll accept them as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you, the best dressed folks at the Ham Fest this year won't want to be left out on this special offer. That's true. And you know, the Dayton Ham Vention's coming up in a few months. Yep. Time to start getting your. Uh, Amateur Logic and Ham College swag in so you'll be stylish while you're walking around the big ham fest there. Yeah. 
So go to amateurlogic.spreadshirt.com and order yours today. And speaking of ham fest, Tommy, you and I are kind of planning a trip, and I, I think the cheap We're old man is on some sort of a trip. Email anyway. will be there too. Yeah. Well, true. But we're really uh, road trip. Road trip. And it's going to be different because we've never been to this, this one before. Yeah, this is going to be a new experience, and we're going to actually do something that we've never done there yep. before. So it should be good. I'm looking forward to it. So if any of you happen to be in Cajun country. Yeah. That's about Cajun country as it gets, too, I think. It is. Rain, Louisiana. We're going to be at the Ham Fest there. Is it the 9th and the 10th? Does that sound right? Well, I believe it is. Well, let's just see. I just so happen to have a calendar right here. You do have a calendar right there. That would be the 9th and the 10th. You're correct. And Rain, Louisiana, that's over uh, not too terribly far from Lafayette, I guess. Yeah, somewhere in that general, general vicinity. I've never been there. I've wanted to go because I understand it's a really great time. You got great food. Music mm -hmm. there is just kind of unlike any ham fest that you've yeah. been to. I mean, where are you going to go and get Zotico? You're not going to hear that in Dayton. No. So you got to go to Rain. Got to go to Rain. And email is going to join us there. We just found out today that he will be there as well. Uh, we're looking forward to big time, and we are planning on shooting the next Amateur Logic there. We don't know how we're going to do it, if it's just going to be separate segments or if we're going to stand up and uh, talk for an hour. We won't be able to live stream that when we do it, at least we don't think we uh, will. Unless we can come up with some internet somewhere, yeah. which I, I'm not sure. We've got hot spots, but I don't, I don't know what the bandwidth will be like there. So we really, we're, we're not promising we'll live stream that. We may come back, though, and live stream uh, some of the raw footage and get in the chat room with y'all and uh, talk about it. Because it's going to be an experience. I've never never been to uh, a sure enough Cajun ham fest before. And this this is the premier one from what I understand. Yeah. They say the food there is just fantastic and yep. super friendly. I'm really looking forward to it. It should be a great time. Yep. If you're in the area or you feel like driving down, come join us. And if you're going, uh, if you got Amateur Logic swag, like we mentioned earlier, wear it and, and uh, show the colors there. Yeah. We were going to be wearing ours. Well, unfortunately, we're out of gold PL259, so we can't give those away. Yeah, we'll have to come up uh, with something else this yeah. time. Extra crowdhead. Yeah. Something. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for being here, everyone. We will catch you at the end of next month for the next time college and Amateur logic around the middle of the month. Yep. 73, everybody. We'll see you next time. 73. A, observation of propagation and reception. B, the frequency must be coordinated with the National Beacon Organization. No. Oh, I'm uh, on the wrong well, question, aren't I? You need to get, where's your other, here. Yeah, I need to, see, I told you these don't work for seeing this close. We're going to talk about the origins of Bodo. I'll probably pronounce this about six eight different ways that are probably all wrong just to make sure we got thing. it covered yeah, yeah.